Hello, everybody, and welcome to our virtual event, Implementing Virtual Exchange in European Higher Education, Different Approaches and Initiatives. Um, my name is Robert O'Dowd. I work at the University of Leon in Spain, and I'm going to introduce you to our event today. Um, I should also introduce you maybe to Francesca Helm at the University of Padua, who's doing the, the technical work for us today and organizing all of this. You can wave, Fran, if I don't know if they can see you, but anyway. Um, so this event is being organized by three different projects and initiatives. And these are the Erasmus Plus project Evolve, which is evidence-validated online learning through virtual exchange. Uh, the European Commission's flagship project, uh, Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, and the University of Edinburgh's NICE project, which stands for Network for Intercultural Competences to Facilitate Entrepreneurship. Uh, this is also co-funded by the European Plus program. Um, I think we have about 350 registered participants for our webinar today, and you're coming to us from over 30 different countries. Um, we believe that this confirms the interest in virtual exchange, which is emerging all over the world at the moment. Uh, so we are very happy to have you all. You're very welcome, and thank you for joining us. Okay. So uh, let me just show you the schedule about how we're going to organize our event. Um, I'm going to... Um, First of all, I will be providing a very brief explanation of what we mean by virtual exchange and why we believe uh, it should be an important part of universities' internationalization strategies. Uh, we will then go on to the presentations, starting with Sarah Guth, from the, who is president of the UNO Collaboration Organization for Virtual Exchange. And Sarah will be talking to us about the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange project. Uh, following that, uh, Saki Jagar, Gerdinche Ogel, and Juan Alba Duran from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands will be speaking to you about the Evolve project and will report some case studies which illustrate how universities are integrating virtual exchange into their internationalization programs. And finally, we have Anna Creary and Is Isabel Majewski Anderson from the University of Edinburgh in the UK to tell you about the lessons learned from the NICE project. Uh, following the three presentations, we will have then about 10 minutes, we hope, for questions and discussion, okay? Uh, Miriam Hauk from the Open University in the UK will be redirecting to the speakers some of the questions which you have put in the question and answers tool, okay? Uh, if you look at, the, the, at your Zoom application, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, uh, there is a Q&A button, okay? That's where you should write your questions. Okay, and, we, and then Miriam will try to redirect these to the different speakers at the end, okay? Um, if you want just to chat and to comment on the presentations as you're listening, you can use, of course, the chat tool. And for those of you on Twitter, we recommend the hashtags virtual exchange and or virtually VE next steps. Okay, you can see them there on the screen. Okay, so moving on. Um, let me just, so Fran, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, uh, let's think a little bit about why you, people might be here today and why you might be interested in the whole idea of virtual exchange, okay? Uh, well, first of all, um, I don't know about your individual universities or your individual countries, but the current rates of physical mobility in universities is actually quite low. Uh, you can see this report from Europe about European mobility uh, from recent, very recently, and the average in Europe is 8%, okay? 8% of students are engaging in uh, physical mobility programs, okay? That is very low. And I think if we move on to the next slide, we'll probably agree that the impact of the COVID-19 um, pandemic is going to have also a very negative impact on, uh, impact on student mobility. So what we are doing is we are proposing virtual exchange uh, certainly not as a replacement to, to physical mobility, but as a complement, as something that can be integrated with physical mobility into universities' internationalization programs, okay? These are what we could say are the basic characteristics of virtual exchange. Engaging groups of students in sustained online intercultural interaction and collaboration uh, with partners in other cultural contexts or geographical locations as an integrated part of their coursework and under the guidance of educators and facilitators. So the key ideas here are online collaborative learning between students, its integration into study programs, and the idea that teachers or facilitators provide mentoring or support to students during this learning process. 
Okay, so that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to show you different projects and different initiatives that are, are trying to put this into practice. All right. Uh, one more slide from me before, before I leave you. Uh, I wanted just to show you some of the questions that some of you had already put into, the, in, into your application form when you, when you signed up for this, for this webinar. Um, some of you asked about, for example, how to promote learning, how to assess students learning in virtual exchange, and, but others have asked about how to become part of these networks that we see here, and uh, also how to balance virtual and physical mobility components in blended mobility formats. Uh, this is going to be very relevant, especially in Europe in the, in the, coming, in the coming years, because in the new Erasmus Plus program, blended mobility is going to be, um, you know, quite, a, you know, quite an important aspect. So I think that this is one way we can look at integrating virtual exchange. Okay, th that's Thank you, Rob, for that introduction. And thank you to the people who organized this webinar for inviting me. Um, my name is Sarah Gav, and I teach English as a foreign language at the University of Padova in Italy. And I'm also president of Uni Collaboration, which is an organization um, that focuses on promoting virtual exchange in various ways. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange Project. Um, because I think it has many unique features that are helping move the field of virtual exchange forward. So the next slide, Fran. So briefly, um, this is a pilot project of the commission. This is not an EU funded project. It is actually a project that the commission contracted to a consortium. And it, it started in 2018. And basically the commission was aware that there was a need to expand the reach and scope of the Erasmus Plus program because of the numbers that Robert showed you previously about the limited number of students that go abroad. Um, so the aim was to develop an innovative way for young people to engage in intercultural experiences online. Um, so we had an original target of 25,000 youth um, that we were supposed to reach by the end of this year. And we've actually already exceeded that number. So it's been quite a successful project. Um, and one of the main characteristics of the project um, is to explore different models of virtual exchange and therefore it is being implemented by a consortium of partners and each consortium kind of focuses on its own different specific model of virtual exchange. Um, the target audience um, of people taking part in the activities are young people aged 18 to 30 who are residing within the Erasmus Plus program countries and the Southern Mediterranean. But because we do lots of training, the project also targets higher education professors, university managers and administrators, um, educators, of course, as well as youth workers. Um, so another uh, unique characteristic of, of the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange pro program, pilot program, um, is the focus it has put on really developing uh, the use of open badges as a form of recognizing students' participation in these programs. Because in the past, very often students participated in virtual exchange, but it was not recognized in any official way. Um, as part of developing the open badges, um, we have also developed um, a competency framework that um, took from existing competency frameworks um, to really focus on the soft skills and transversal skills that um, virtual exchange helps develop and which are rarely recognized within um, institutional courses as part of their syllabi and curricula. Um, and we, just one second, Fran, go back. And it's, we just really wanna point out the importance of there being recognition of these skills that are developed through virtual exchange. Okay. No, <laughs> okay. So the question is, can it be integrated into a university, into university programming? And here I'm going to talk about the two different ways that Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange has looked to integrate a virtual exchange into these programs. The first is that students or youth can participate in what we call ready-made exchanges. And these can be as part of a component of the organization's courses and activities, or students can do it individually separately as an add-on or extracurricular activity. And the second option is that professors and youth workers can develop their own grassroots exchanges um, based on their own needs. So I'll briefly explain these different models now. Um, so the ready-made virtual exchanges that we offer 
there are several different ones. Um, Social Circles is a very short program. It lasts two to three weeks and it is kind of a taster into virtual exchange, gives students a feel of what virtual exchange is. Whereas the other two programs, Connect Program and Cultural Encounters, um, are longer programs lasting eight to 10 weeks. And these are all programs um, that exist and are ready made and you can just jump into them. And then the second type of activity we offer is training. And so we develop, we offer training to help people develop their own virtual exchanges. And there's also a training to help um, people learn how to become facilitators who can facilitate dialogue in online virtual exchanges. Okay, so just briefly about the ready-made exchanges. I'm not gonna go into extensive detail, um, but one of the benefits of these exchanges um, is that they're really diverse because they're not organized between two partners per se, um, but what they do is they create groups of 10 to 12 students and um, these students mostly come from 10 to 12 different countries. So they're truly diverse and cross-cultural for this reason. Um, and they are very much learner led. So they start with a topic or a theme, um, but then the learners in their small groups um, decide how that discussion is going to go. And um, these programs, the existing exchanges are primarily, they're fundamentally based on synchronous communication. So usually about two hours of synchronous meetings between these groups of students of 10 to 12 students, um, two hours once a week for several weeks. And what are the benefits for the institutions who participate in these ready-made exchanges? Well, they're ready-made. <laughs> so you don't need to do all of the training that I'll talk about later. Um, so the exchange implementation is taken care of, as is the tech support. Um, they have years of experience, so they have well-developed curricula um, with specific learning goals that they can share with you so you can find a way to implement it into your existing courses and programs. And um, these exchanges, as well as the training and all of the activities in Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, also undergo rigorous evaluation. And we have um, taken the monitoring and evaluation of all of our activities very seriously. And um, they are reported um, in our reports that are posted on the website, which I will share with you at the end of my slides. So just briefly, again, I'm not going to go into much detail, but the Connect program is a program um, that lasts four to eight weeks. Um, and it brings together students um, from different countries, as I said before, and it has a menu of global topics that then students, the learners participating in the activity, um, choose what to focus on. And um, so it's primarily just these um, two hour synchronous sessions. And there are also readings and other activities that students do between the sessions. These sessions, no, go back one second. <laughs> The sessions are led by facilitators who have been trained to um, manage these conversations so that each uh, young person's voice is heard in the dialogue. And I, so I put the dates of the upcoming um, Connect program, but you can find that again on the hub that I'll show you later. So next. So cultural encounters is similar to the Connect program, but it tends to focus more on a topic. So the topic for the upcoming semester will be the environment. In the past, the topics have been issues of refugees, um, issues of European identity, and um, it really tends to pick up on what's um, relevant in the, the time period um, that we're going through. Um, so it's topical and it involves a little more content than the Connect program. So there are lecture series by academics and practitioners and then they also have these weekly two-hour dialogue sessions and interactive assignments that they have to do to get credits at the end. And it's a bit longer, it lasts nine weeks. And again, it'll be coming up in the fall. So those are the exchanges that exist and are ready-made that you can just tap into as an institution. Then for various reasons, there are people who want to develop their own virtual exchange. So we have different training opportunities. So we, in the context of Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, we call uh, our virtual exchanges transnational Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange projects, but that's a mouth load, so we say TEPS. Um, and we offer two trainings, basically. Um, the first is the basic training, which aims to really give an introduction to what virtual exchange is and how you might want to integrate it in your institution. 
and the other is the advanced training, uh, which is more specifically for partners of educators who have decided to come together and develop their own virtual exchange. Um, the basic training lasts four weeks and it's open to not only teachers, but really to international staff at the university, to, to deans and higher level decision makers as well. And the advanced training lasts six weeks and both of these trainings will be offered in the fall in English and French. Next. So what are the benefits of taking the time and effort to design your own TEP instead of um, just using a ready-made one? Well, they help you understand the rationale behind VE. Um, and it's a learning by doing experience. So by going through the training, you're actually experiencing a virtual exchange. Um, and so it helps you focus on the innovative pedagogical approach that is virtual exchange. It helps you become familiar with the tools that we use that can be used. Um, it allows you to respond to specific learning outcomes that you might have and that you can customize to your specific needs and your field. Um, we then offer you support in developing your TEP and um, from an institutional point of view, it can also help strengthen partnerships. And um, once a TEP has been run a few times, it can also be developed into a larger scale TEP, which becomes, could become something more like the ready-made exchanges that I discussed before. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, so the TEPs, I'm not going to say much about this here because um, the colleagues that come after me are going to talk um, about different types of virtual, about this type of virtual exchange but they're usually bilateral or multilateral. Um, they can have different durations and um, they can also support mobility. So either by encouraging people um, who did not necessarily want to study abroad to go on study abroad, um, or what Robert said at the beginning in terms of blended mobility to, um, you can have virtual exchange supporting the mobility before or after, or before and after the actual physical mobility experience. So the, the, I'm gonna skip the next slide, Fran, in terms of time. Um, it just gives examples of how people have been implementing Erasmus plus virtual exchange in their um, institutions. And I can talk more about that later in the question and answer if necessary. And here is a link to the website where you can find all the information about um, Erasmus plus virtual exchange. So both our programs, um, our uh, reports, and our resources as well that you can take back to your institutions. So next slide. Thank you for listening to me, and I would like to pass it over to my colleagues at the Evolve Project. Uh, my name is Sake Jager. I work at the uh, University of Groningen as a project manager in teaching and learning innovation. And I'm also the project coordinator of the Evolve project. Uh, the Evolve project is meant to mainstream virtual exchange into higher education. And this means it tries to get universities to use virtual exchange on a larger scale. And the way we have done this is very similar to what you heard before. We have provided training and mentoring to teachers uh, who want to support this integration process. Um, several universities will probably also want to organize this training themselves, which is why we intend in just a few weeks, actually, to make the training materials available as open educational resources. This means that other universities who want to set up their own training will be able to import a Moodle course into their learning environments so that they can translate it and adapt it to their own purposes. And we will also share our experiences so that institutions will be able to set up their own training if they want to. The other thing we will be doing is, and we have been doing is doing research um, on the impact of virtual exchange and how universities are going about implementing it. And we will also publish these results on the website and share them with you, including the research instruments that we have developed. But one thing that has really become clear over the past two years in which I've been running this project is not so much that the institutions should be developing or validating all these models because the models, as you have already heard, are already exist. 
and there's already a lot of evidence that they actually work towards you know, fostering certain learning outcomes. So it is much more, in my mind, about how universities go about organizing the implementation of virtual exchange into their programs. And this is something that my colleagues Khadij Ochel and Juan Alba Duran will be talking about now. Yes, thank you, Sake, for introducing uh, the EVOC project. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going just to introduce the EVOC case study, uh, and then I, I pass to Gerdinche. She's going to um, give examples and really explain in detail the case studies. Um, so as a deliver deliverable of um, the EVOC project, one of them is this multi-case study. Uh, report whose working title is the one you can see there um, towards virtual exchange as an institutionally recognized and supported practice uh, the pioneers perspective. The study aims to identify stakeholders motivations and steps taken towards the recognition and implementation of virtual exchange across disciplines in higher education institutions in Europe. Uh, we interviewed uh, key drivers at each institution. This is stakeholders uh, taking the lead in the promotion of virtual exchange at each institution. These interviewed actors are from nine universities, uh, which you can see in order in the slide. University of Groningen, Edinburgh, Bordeaux, Granada, Limerick, University of Applied Science in Utrecht, Universidad de Padova, eh, Würzburg, and Newcastle. Eh, the report reflects the driver's perspectives, so not, not the whole institution. Um, and Herdinche will uh, tell you a bit more um, about the preliminary results of this uh, case study. I hope you find it interesting. Yes, thank you very much, Saka and Juan, for introducing. Uh, my name is Gedintje Ochel. I'm a lecturer of Spanish at the University of Groningen, but I am also involved as a researcher in these uh, case studies we have, um, we have realized. Um, today we, we are going to talk uh, about the different models of virtual exchange ready-made and co-designed, as already explained by uh, Sarah Goss, uh, and how these have been implemented in these institutions we have uh, studied. We will also talk about the stakeholders involved. We see uh, both, um, we see stakeholders operating both at the bottom up and the top down level. Uh, and then we will also uh, see some uh, tendencies towards institutional funding and supports. Uh, next slide, please. Well, here, you, here we have the two models again. As you can see in six out of nine universities, uh, both models are implemented. The ready-made exchanges are usually implemented as extracurricular activities, but also, uh, for example, as um, replacement of high-level English courses. Um, we see uh, this happening at all of these in uh, institutions. Uh, the co-designed exchanges uh, are more likely to be implemented in uh, different disciplines, although they, they, although they uh, used to start um, well, in the humanities because of, um, well, the focus, focus on, um, um, on transversal skills. But the co-designed exchanges can also be implemented in disciplines. And this is a challenge for um, the University of Groningen, for example, also for the University of uh, Newcastle. Um, and in Granada, we see that um, there is a, a focus on the ready-made exchanges. They do not, uh, they do not they have yet implemented uh, TAPS, telecollaboration, or COILS, which are other uh, names for the co-designed exchanges. Uh, next slide, please. As for the different drivers leading virtual exchange in institutions, uh, we see that um, we have identified four uh, scenarios. Actually, we see in all scenarios that virtual exchange continues to be bottom-up driven, which is good because in the end, it's the educators who have to do the job. Um, so, uh, we see in the first two scenarios, we see uh, mainly educators uh, driving virtual exchange. In the second scenarios, scenario, we see international officers uh, being really involved in the implementation. 
But next to this, this, we also see a more active involvement from policymakers in different institutions and also stakeholders from different relevant areas, which are important for, for bringing virtual exchange to the next level, such as um, teacher uh, professional development uh, areas, of course, also the international office, but and career service center for, for students, uh, we see um, an emerging collaboration between these stakeholders. Holders. In the next slides, uh, we will give some examples. As for uh, the bottom, the really bottom-up driven uh, institutions, uh, University of Padua has a long-standing uh, tradition of educators uh, implementing virtual, the co-designed model of virtual exchange, uh, having established um, long-standing partnerships, stable partnerships, and networks. They also implemented ready-made exchanges even before the existence of uh, EVE together with um, external organizations. But at the moment we are also seeing uh, since a couple of years that the international offices has become uh, more interested and is now collaborating on the e-tandem learning pre-mobility project together with the language center. At the same time, in, in, um, in situations of uh, COVID, we see the International uh, Relations Division calling for the need of virtual exchange to be, um, to be a risk mitigation strategy uh, for students uh, who might not be able to go abroad anymore because of the situation. Then the Universities of Edinburgh, the, universities, uh, the University of Applied Sciences in Utrecht, uh, they show um, virtual exchange being um, uh, being driven by uh, international offices mainly, um, and this is uh, this is an this is a challenge because uh, they are the ones who uh, do offer opportunities to educators, um, who uh, even uh, take the trainings and uh, try to um, give educators a case-to-case -case, uh, support. But since there are no uh, incentives for educators themselves uh, and their departments to implement virtual exchange, uh, this is uh, more difficult for them. Although, of course, there are, there are these ready-made uh, virtual exchanges, uh, such as the NICE project, uh, in which uh, students can always uh, participate. In Edinburgh, this is the case. The NICE project is being coordinated through the international office. Next slide, please. The more active involvement of policymakers. Uh, we see this happening at the University of Newcastle, where uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor actually uh, commissioned a mapping of all virtual exchange activities in this institution. This is a very important uh, thing to do because uh, this will help creating a university wide open understanding of virtual exchange. What are we talking about? Uh, another important um, aspect is the recognition of credits for students. This is already happening happening in a couple of uh, in a couple of institutions, and especially in Granada, uh, the uh, virtual exchanges being offered through uh, external organ organizations or projects uh, have been um, even uh, have even received accreditation through the Ministry of um, Education in Spain. Uh, this is really uh, exceptional. Then the the University of uh, Bordeaux is a really interesting example because thanks to the uh, active involvement and endorsement of the Vice Presidency of Internationalization, the key uh, bottom-up driver, the educator really driving this, uh, has, has um, received a, a lot of help. And thanks to this, uh, there are now um, strategies uh, being implemented uh, as from next year onwards. So this is uh, important and in this sense uh, we can also say that the University of Bordeaux is uh, moving towards um, the next uh, uh, scenario because uh, now also teacher, de teacher uh, professional development uh, areas um, and uh, are, well, uh, are, are involved and also the tracking of uh, virtual exchange as an alternative form of mobility uh, is uh, being implemented in Bordeaux. Something similar we uh, see happening at the universities of uh, Groningen and Würzburg, where stakeholders, the bottom-up drivers, uh, have uh, been actively looking for uh, collaboration with, um, with areas inside uh, the universities, but also with the, v the VE community at large. 
Uh, this is uh, very important um, because um, uh, this, uh, this way it has been, the, the drivers have been able to implement virtual exchange in, um, uh, in training uh, offered through the educational support and innovation um, services at the University of Groningen and also in the um, uh, teacher professional, professional development international teaching and learning uh, certificates where you this has been done in collaboration with eve but also the coaching uh, um, offered through uh, the um, the teacher development area itself um, has um, has been recognized next slide please um, the next, uh, in the next uh, slides, we see uh, how the different tendencies, uh, which are the different tendencies towards institutional funding, support, we have identified. In the first place, we have seen that the external projects have been very important to uh, introduce or further develop virtual exchange at institutions. We also see a mix of uh, support from these projects or programs and uh, internal funding or support structures and uh, in the end there are uh, at the University of Bordeaux, Groningen and Würzburg um, project-based uh, initiatives uh, which are internally uh, funded or supported. This slide shows uh, how uh, important the uh, three projects have been at these universities. For example, the University of Edinburgh, uh, at this university, virtual exchange has been, has been introduced thanks to NICE, universities of Limerick, universities of, uh, of Padua, and also um, uh, Granada see, uh, see a high race of uh, see, uh, increasing student, an increasing number of students participating in virtual exchange. And at the universities of uh, Groningen and Newcastle, the EVOLVE project has been uh, important to further develop um, uh, virtual exchange and to get a, a better understanding of what it is about. At the University of Würzburg there has been, um, there has been uh, national funding as well uh, from the German uh, government. Next slide. Uh, these projects and fundings have uh, led to other initiatives, the INSIGHT project which is actually uh, a blended mobility format, virtual exchange being uh, used as a pre preparation for a summer school. This project builds on the NICE project, but has been um, funded as well through, um, through the institution itself. In Würzburg, thanks to the funding received, virtual exchange is now being implemented in the teacher professional development program. Also, the Career Service Center at the University of Würzburg offers virtual exchange to students um, in an extracurricular program. And then the last, uh, last two um, examples are from the universities of uh, Bordeaux and uh, Groningen, where we see uh, already internal uh, funding through different projects. Uh, I would like to uh, end this presentation with a quote from one of our interviewees, uh, which says that there are both top-down and uh, bottom-up initiative, initiatives, but the weak link is the faculty college level. They need to integrate the credits via the academic councils and allow hours in teaching posts to support VE. And these, this also relates very much to other important takeaways we have seen in the case studies, like uh, commitment, which is needed from institutions, assigning resources, bridging the gap between the bottom up and the top down, monitor fee activities, uh, make sure that, that uh, the institution is aware of what types of activities are happening, Includes VE across those disciplines, a clear definition of VE is also uh, very important and have students advocates, uh, have uh, teachers advocates. Okay, uh, and also promote it. Yes, this is it. I'm going uh, to give the floor to uh, Anna. Hey, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. And um, I just wish I could see you all. Um, I can't quite believe there are 350 people, but, um, but it, it's amazing to know that there's such a level of interest for virtual exchange activities. And I'm sure um, we're all adjusting to the new, new normal. And I'd like to talk to you about NICE, the Network for Intercultural Competence and Entrepreneurship Project. Next slide, please. So I'll be doing that in 10 minutes um, with my wonderful colleague Anna Creary, 
who's the project manager for the Study and Workaway service. And I should introduce myself. My name is Isabel Mieski Anderson, and I'm the head of a newly formed service called Study and Workaway. So we will be sharing with you some of our insights into why um, the, the NICE project was created, because I think that's really important. And also, of course, I think importantly, some of the lessons, the painful lessons, <laughs> the exciting lessons that we've learned and how we have applied those. Next slide, please. So first of all, what I'm going to talk to you about the NICE project itself and, and what it is and how it operates. But before I do that, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of insight as to why we originally created this. This, this, was, this was sort of drafted about three and a half years ago at a time where we had a very successful uh, portfolio of international and European exchange opportunities. But what was very clear was that there was a real demand to diversify that portfolio, to think about shorter term experiences, but also to think about how we could create a virtual opportunity. And, and why is that important? Uh, I'm sure you're all well-practiced practitioners in this, but, but, but I think just important to restate the reason why that was important from a University of Edinburgh perspective was that we wanted to ensure that those students who physically couldn't go anywhere, go abroad for, for either caring because they have caring responsibilities or because they had other obligations like a part-time job or physically they just couldn't embrace that opportunity. And, and we felt it was important to create a program that afforded that, that gave them an, an experience that, that was interculturally grounded, but also enhanced some of their other uh, employment graduate attribute skills to ensure that they were equipped for the future working world. So that is partly why the University of Edinburgh created this um, and we, we selected very carefully a very, very strong consortium of partners who I will share with you in due course. Next slide, please. So what, what, is, what is nice? Uh, first of all, I should mention it's a three year funded project under the Erasmus Strategic Partnership Fund. And it does a number of key things, but I think most importantly and fundamentally, the reason why we're so excited and passionate about this project is because it enhances the employability prospects of our students. And the way it does that is by equipping them with intercultural competence, skills and abilities, by ensuring that, um, that the students have an opportunity to work within cohorts of, of teams of five. And we've selected, so each team of five is selected uh, from a, a different institution. So you have five students from different institutions, from different backgrounds, working together. Um, they then work together to also acquire some entrepreneurship skills. And of course, through that experience of having to interact over the course of a seven, modular program, they're having to negotiate those relationships, they're having to create a team, they're having to create a team dynamic, they're having to ensure that there's someone who's sort of leading the team, those, that type of role changes every single week whilst the students are working their transnational setup. And those students ultimately, we believe, um, have a heightened level of transversal and soft skills and of course ultimately enhances their global citizenship attributes. So that is what we mean by enhancing and building the employability skills. But what does it actually deliver? And, and we have now been through two iterations of the NICE program itself and typically we have, as I said, we have teams of five students working in a transnational setup undertaking a seven modular framework. And what that means is that every week students will meet to work through their modular content and there is learning on that modular content, but there's also some reflective aspects and importantly, they're being asked to undertake a task jointly. Um, those modules are non-credit bearing, but they're highly experiential. 
what those teams are being asked to do in practicing their intercultural learning capabilities and their ability to, to, uh, to acquire uh, their entrepreneurship learning is they apply that through addressing a global challenge problem. And that is from one of the UN sustainability goals. So, so they, have, they have the opportunity of identifying something they feel passionate about and then really working together as a team to come up with a solution to that global challenge. And they do that by practicing the ability to work in an intercultural team, which I can tell you is incredibly challenging, and, and being able to, to navigate through a seven modular program through those challenges and to really arrive at a position where they've produced a business model canvas. As I said, the online modules are not credit bearing but some of our partners have been able to award credit as a result of the, the the content that was produced by the consortium and then the final aspect i want to mention is that there is a credit bearing component and i think a really important component because while students are embracing this new virtual experience it's really important to reflect on that experience. And it's important to extract the learning from actually engaging with other students and being able to sort of communicate that to prospective employers and to, to extract the value and the impact from that. And we do that through something called a SLIC, a student-led individually created course, which has a very strong reflective component on that. And that is supported by an academic group of colleagues from across our consortium members. What I should also stress is the importance that those online modules are not just done in isolation. The student teams meet, but they're highly supported every week by a trained and skilled facilitator who ensures that things are progressing. And then finally, we have an in-person summer school experience. So albeit the majority of the program is delivered virtually, there is also a blended approach in that there is a summer school experience. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. We could have the next slide, please. So it's very important to stress that, that we are working very, very closely. We're delighted to have such a strong consortia. And interesting also for you to know that that consortia is built up of two networks. One is the Coimbra Group, and we have representation from the Coimbra Group on this consortium. And the other is Universitas 21 or U21. So we, we very carefully hand selected these partners because they either bring with them intercultural competence capability or entrepreneurship ability or technical capability because obviously we needed to build the modular program itself and as you can see here we selected a number of the UN sustainability development goals so that students could really focus in on those next slide please and just to sort of share with you some of the images, and I, I, I think it's really important to reflect for me for a moment, just to acknowledge the fact that, you know, unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you have had to cancel um, current mobility activity in this semester and potentially even in semester one of next academic session but the one thing the one thing that wasn't impacted uh, probably the only thing that wasn't impacted was our nice program this year which students undertook from sort of march onwards and the feedback we've had from those students um, has just been tremendous i'm not going to share with you that if you if you'd like to know more um, please have a look at the website but but just to give you some images Obviously, as you can see, we, we did have a physical summer school last year at University College Dublin. So that's just a sort of moment of capturing that and, um, and some other images of, of students going through their journey. And I think that's what virtual mobility, virtual exchange, that's what's so important. It's a journey, it's an experience that students are being guided through and supported through, and they're also being helped to reflect on that experience. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Anna Creary, who's going to share with you some of the lessons learned. So over to Anna. Thanks very much, Isabel. Uh, hopefully everyone can see me. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Fran. Uh, so yes, if you could go to the next slide, I'm going to talk through some of the internal and the uh, consortium-wide lessons that we've learned over the past couple of years. 
Uh, so first of all, you can see I've highlighted a few things on the slide, and I would say virtual learning recognition. Internally, this was relatively new to Edinburgh. Um, from our experience, and especially within the study and work workaway service, we'd not worked uh, on a virtual learning program before, and we had a lot of learning to do with our colleagues in various schools and within the colleges to learn how this work could actually be recognized because it stood a bit outside of the traditional uh, learning um, the traditional learning at the university. I would also say platform testing. Within our consortium, Edinburgh was responsible for uh, building the platform that all of our nice students worked through um, within their virtual or their online modules. And we learned a lot about testing and retesting and what would work. And, you know, we thought what would work perhaps didn't and what we thought might not work did. And so we ended up having to go through it a number of times. And I think it was a good learning experience in that virtual exchange isn't um, isn't something that is set and then continues on. It's something that we uh, regularly had to uh, had to work on and had to make sure that we were giving students the best opportunity. I would also say that that kind of comes into the student support requirements. So we had 160 students participating and we had about a pool of I would say between 20 and 40 staff and we were getting emails from them pretty frequently and obviously this is a good thing but it was a bit uh it was a bit of a, a learning curve to to figure out exactly how much student uh support we need to we needed to be giving to make sure that they were all having um having a good experience i would also say that the non-standard course length that was something that was a, a bit new for us at edinburgh as well the nice program doesn't necessarily fit within the standard um, semester at the University of Edinburgh. So we had to learn how to accommodate the things that we needed to do within our team to make sure that the students who are particip participating from Edinburgh and from our partner institutions could still get the credit they need, get the support they need, and make sure that they have, were having a, a good experience on the project. Um, and I think that that also relates to credit recognition and transfer. Uh, at Edinburgh, this is again a new thing. So figuring out what we need to do within our own institution to make sure that we can get uh, the credit transfer across to students uh, from our partner, um, for our partner institutions. And finally, privacy and information storage and transfer. Uh, that was um, interesting because within the rules at Edinburgh we are quite particular about how student data is transferred as we needed to be and so we needed to figure out how to accommodate you know application information that was going between partners and across the consortium and I mean it was it was a it was a learning curve our first year and I think we did some really fantastic work between our first year and our second year to make sure that the processes that we were um, that we enacted in our second year actually fit and that we were doing everything we needed to do for, um, you know, to keep students' data private. Uh, Fran, if you could go to the next slide. So consortium-wide lessons. Now, before I kind of talk them through a little bit, I'm just going to say, I think that communication and flexibility, I would also say, was key across our consortium. And as Isabel mentioned, we have a really strong consortium with uh, a number of very committed partners who are all engaged and wanting to make this work. And I think that that really was an important part of making this program successful. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting was the scheduling calendar. So again, we have institutions uh, who have different schedules and we needed to be able to adhere to those schedules. And so how could the program be flexible enough that it allowed students who were participating in a group of five to actually engage in the work and do the work whilst at the same time they were doing their other work. And so we had to make sure that things were flexible enough for those students so they could still get it done within the time frame that we'd given them. In addition, we dealt with some challenges with student dropouts. Uh, you know, if a student drops out halfway through, how do we deal with that? What do we do with the rest of their student numbers? How do we make sure that we put them together in a group that's successful? And in addition to that, we have student crisis. So how do we communicate to a student who's perhaps going through a period of crisis that as, as the coordinator, Edinburgh needs to be aware, but also their facilitator and their host institution needs to be aware and that they're, they're, they're getting the support that they need from all of us. And again, that, that came down to communication, I think, for everyone. Uh, I think 
in addition to that, one of the main challenges that we worked through was the work recognition. Um, and Isabel touched on this beforehand. We have different partners who are recognizing different parts of the uh, of the NICE project as a whole, which is great. It's fantastic to be able to say as a as a student and you are going to this partner, this is the recognition you receive. And as another student going to this other partner, this is the recognition you receive. And just so students are aware and they're very clear on what they receive when they participate and why it's perhaps different from what one of their other group members may participate or may receive. And I think um, following on from that, the facilitation training and the staff training for the SLIC, that was another challenge. Uh, making sure that we had a group of facilitators that knew what they were doing, that understood uh, how to help the students be successful without necessarily taking control and um, helping the staff who were assessing the SLIC understand about reflective learning and what that looks like um, and how they could assess reflective learning if perhaps they would not done that before. So there were a lot of really interesting challenges that we've had the chance to work through in the past uh, two years. Uh, this is just a bit of a quick a quick stop through um, but if you have any questions please do get in touch and I will now pass back to Bob I believe or perhaps Miriam to, to run the question and answer. Thank you. So what I'm showing you here is the International Virtual Exchange Conference. Um, in, in past years, Unicollaboration Collaboration had its own conference. Um, and there were also, there was an organization in the United States called the State University of New York's um, Center for Collaborative Online International Learning. They had their own conference on virtual exchange. And there were other universities that had one. And so we decided to come together and create a group of people who would have one conference on virtual exchange a year called the International Virtual Exchange Conference. And this year it was supposed to be hosted um, in Newcastle. And I saw in the chat that we do have colleagues here from Newcastle. And unfortunately, because of COVID, um, that's not gonna happen. So we're going to hold the conference anyway. It's going to be online and we're coming up with um, many different modalities for the presentations as well as social events during the conference. And so it's online. It's going to be three days at the beginning of September. And um, anybody who's really interested in knowing more about what's going on in the field of virtual exchange, um, what people are doing, and you want to um, become part of this broader community of people involved in virtual exchange, I would suggest you look into maybe participating in this conference. So I will put the link in the chat as well. Um, but it was very successful last year and we actually, it was in two, uh, where was it? Um, Tacoma, Washington last year. And this year we had a, a very high number of um, people who sent in proposals. And so the fact that we can't hold it in person um, is kind of sad for everyone. But as I said, we will have networking events, sh social events, as well as partnering events for people who are looking for partners. So if you're interested in the International Virtual Exchange Conference, please um, go to this website and register and maybe we'll see you there. So I'll put a link to it in the chat now. That's all I wanted to say on that. We can go to Q&A now. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes for Q&A. First of all, you've seen Saka has also typed in the chat. The recording worked all right. Of course, we will share this with everybody who has come today. We had almost 300 people registering and 147 have joined us. Thank you very much. Now let's look at a few of the questions that have not been addressed yet. Debbie says that uh, she works at one of the faculties of the University of Groningen participate in the ready-made exchanges. Can we join this program as a faculty? Where should I start if we want to promote this exchange to our students? I guess this question goes to the Groningen team. Uh, yes, if I have my video on, someone will have to allow me again. But you can hear me uh, anyway. Oh, so Debbie, Debbie is a colleague of mine. Uh, in fact, this is the Erasmus uh, Plus Virtual Exchange Program, which we've mentioned before, and the link to that will be shared in the, um, in the information about this event. It has already been uh, shared uh, 
in the information uh, on the University of Groningen website, but we can also talk about that. So the Erasmus uh, uh, virtual exchange program is actually run by my colleagues Miriam and Sarah and uh, Francesca, so they know more about it. But if you want to know more about it, Debbie, you can ask me too. Okay, then Lisa asks, how can we as higher education institutions and virtual exchange experts contribute to broaden the offer, the topics of ready-made options? Ready-made options, Sarah, can you speak to this? I would, if, if Fran's still there, I would actually suggest she do that because she's done a lot of work. She's been responsible for that at the University of Padova. So she, Fran, would you want to answer that? Multitasking. <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm webinar master here. That's pretty unfair for you. <laughs> I know, but you have so much experience doing this. Um, so I missed the question. Sorry. Can you? So, <laughs> so yes, how no do you? Problem, no problem. How can we, as higher education, HEI, and virtual exchange experts, contribute to broaden the offer, the topics of ready-made options? Lisa is asking the question. To broaden the topics again. Okay. I, I think um, it's, it's, it's a question of, of, of the demand increasing. I mean, we have the ready-made options. Um, you know, multiple um, themes have been addressed through this year, uh, maybe appealing more to the social sciences um, than other disciplines. But I'd just like to highlight that in Bordeaux, for example, that the Cultural Encounters program um, was offered to uh, students in, in STEM disciplines and, um, and also chemistry. So I think... Um, I think the fact that these exchanges address transversal skills is, um, is relevant to students of any discipline. Um, as for getting ready-made virtual exchanges on other themes, I mean, again, I, I, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with EVE, but I, you know, there are uh, sharing perspectives, for example. They work, it, before EVE existed, they worked with universities um, to develop programs. So, you know, should a consortium of universities come together and want to develop you know, have somebody develop and manage a virtual exchange for a consortium, I'm sure that is something that, that they would be open to doing. Okay, thank you. Thank Wait, you, Sarah. But Miriam, just quickly, and I, I gave a similar answer. If you look in the Q&A box under answered, um, Joshua had asked something similar. So there is an answer there in the, in the already answered questions. And now to finish us off with the $1 million question. How could you sensitize institutional leaders, but also the different stakeholders to formal recognition of virtual exchange and sustainable quality implementation of virtual exchange? Yeah, that is quite the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, let me, let me divide this answer into a few. Well, it's, I think it's actually, there are several questions there. So in terms of sensitizing your students and your institutions, um, it really, to a certain degree, actually depends on your institution because different institutions have different priorities and different strategic goals. And you need to find the one at your institution where um, virtual exchange would fit into that, okay? So if, for example, an institution is focusing on highly on internationalization, you need to find the person who's kind of running that program and find ways to explain to them the ways in which virtual exchange can help promote internationalization because only 8% or 6% or whatever of young people in the institution are actually going on physical mobility. Um, so it's, we also, we lead trainings um, uh, as unique collaboration to work with um, kind of international relations officers and the decision makers at universities to help and of focus on this and, and find out who the stakeholders are at your institution um, to kind of push this. So it's not easy, <laughs> which is why we were all kind of laughing and giggling at first. Um, and then the other question in that question was, what was it? Sorry, Miriam. Does it help, uh, well, it follows on, they carry actually on, does it help if it makes an integral part of exactly. the internationalization at home strategy? Yeah, and so uh, regarding that, uh, I was actually part of um, a survey that we carried out with institutions that do virtual exchange, and we found that the top six institutions, top six meaning they have the largest number of virtual exchange exchanges running at their institutions right now, the top six all had virtual exchange as an integral part of their 
the university's strategy. So I think it does make a huge difference if you're able to get not just a mention of it, yeah, maybe we should do this, but actually integrate it into the strategy. Okay, good, thank you. I think that's all we've got time for today. I know I sound like a radio presenter, radio program presenter. Please everybody jo uh, switch on your cameras. Juan as well and second Isabel, please. Um, thanks for joining us. We will offer another webinar on September the 25th where we will give concrete examples of exchanges and we will focus on learning outcomes for students and teachers. And I know that some of the people who are in the audience today will be speaking on September the 25th. So please mark this date in your diary. September the 25th will be the next webinar as part of the dissemination activities of the Evolve project. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It was really good to have you here. Thank you for everybody who has presented. And the biggest round of applause goes to Francesca, our taskmaster, in the background, please.